Hello, we're live. <laughs> As opposed to being live, yes. we are live. You know, we will oh, probably never be live. Well, as well. never that say never. Never, right? Well, I suppose if we got enough listeners and people you, who were like, listen, let's oh, do a live. Listen to me. Call in. You were show. like a hostess of the shows, so I'm pretty sure you can do something live. So calm down, yeah. probably. Welcome to another week of it would seem as though. The podcast where we talk about anything, everything, and nothing. Mostly nothing. Mostly nothing. <laughs> uh, I'm Vesta. And I'm Annika. And we are both completely drunk today. You, it's Wednesday. What no, else are you supposed to I, do? I know. It's like I like to start my day on Wednesdays, especially Wednesdays, because mm-hmm. it's late start for school for the kids. Yeah. So I get them off to school, and then I start drinking. Wow. You know what I do? I go to therapy. Then I drink. Then I come here. <laughs> and let me tell you. All right. Just kidding. Not drunk. That I, comes oh, later. Yeah, yeah. Totally kidding. Yeah. I'm, I was going to pour <laughs> all the rest of the booze that I had in the cupboard into the crock pot I have of pulled pork. Yeah. But I thought, hmm, better not. <laughs> I might want to drink it later. Yeah. Uh, so I've had the same bottle of booze in my cupboard for three years, mm, uh-huh. and it's probably down about an inch. Wow, from the top. you're gonna you're like, so I was gonna put the rest of the booze in the crock pot, copy <laughs> the entire a bottle. Full, yeah, wow. what is that like a fifth? I don't know, girl. I don't know who you think you're speaking I don't know. to. I don't drink. I don't know. Well, I drink diet coke, but that's it. So we are gonna kind of carry on. And with the fools that we are, and wrap up. <laughs> uh, yeah, and wrap up uh, Black History Month. With uh, talking about music, and we're not strictly going to talk about black artists. We're going to talk about the artists that we love, that inspired us, that stirred our love for music. Mm. Yeah. I mean, because I know for me, not only do, I mean, from a little, little kid. Okay, I was never little. I was always a big kid. But from a child, I've always loved music, and it's always been such an important part of my life. And I was always the kid who I knew every lyric to mm-hmm. every freaking song that was on the radio because, you know, I didn't like other children. So <laughs> what else did you do in the Stone Age, though? There was, well, like, right. write down lyrics and memorize that. Or, like, go kill a dinosaur for dinner. And you were like, mm, right. those were the two jobs in your village. Right. Well... And the dinosaurs were faster than I was. Oh, and you're all great. Right. So I would sit in front of... All right, this is how old I am. I think I've told y'all how old I am, but it doesn't matter. This is how old I am, and only people who are close to my age will understand or relate to this. <laughs> I am old enough that when we wanted to record music, we would hold a record... You know, like a tape recorder mm-hmm. in front of the radio. I hate it. Or... <laughs> what is that? Yeah. We would also... <laughs> Once we made our little tape recordings of our favorite songs, which then by all the way would also have the DJ talking yeah. at the beginning of them or some other bullshit, then we would write down the lyrics oh if God. we wanted to learn them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like you'd totally. pa- you're listen to a pause the tape, mm-hmm. listen to it, pause the tape, girl, girl. I mean, sometimes it was easy. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it was like, okay, those are all clear lyrics, but then sometimes, what the hell are you saying? One of my favorite. What the fuck are they singing? Songs mm-hmm. is uh, "Blinded by the Light" by oh, Man for Man. Yeah, I I know what the lyrics are. I've sure. read the lyrics. Yeah. That's a lie. Yeah, the lyrics clearly are wrapped up like a douche. Uh huh. One hundred. And because when you t- when you once you've used your douche, I imagine you wrap it. It's up, also probably it wrapped when you get it, right? Plastic wrap. Yeah. Duh. So it's, it's like, wrapped up. <laughs> it's clean. It's fresh. It's new. And if you don't know that song, you know what you're missing. It's classic uh, rock and roll, man. Because the real the real lyric is wrapped up like a deuce. Revved up. Revved up. Revved okay. up like a Thanks. deuce. Another Which runner s- in the night. Still, what does that like, even mean? What the fuck's a deuce? A car? I was like, you got poop? Is, I don't get it. <laughs> I don't think he's talking about poop. But he might be. It's man for man. I don't know. He had two hit songs. That one and Quinn the Eskimo. So deeply racist music. Oh, so I don't know. God. Who cares? Some white guy. Who knows? Yeah, we're not talking about him. No, I'll talk about some white guy later. (laughs) Right. Uh, So, but from the time I was really young, as soon as I really started listening to music, which was super young, I remember um, being three and listening to Motown. Mm. I didn't know it was Motown. Right. Didn't know what it was called. Didn't know anything. I just knew that I heard the voice of an angel when I heard Miss Diana Ross (laughs) singing. And I was like, like, you know. 
the skies opened up and the, yeah, yeah, like that, mm-hmm. like that. It was amazing, Beautiful. and I was just all, I don't know who she is, mm-hmm. but I immediately, of course, learned all the lyrics to every Supreme right. song. Because Diana Ross and the Supremes were the shit. Mm. I mean, come on. Mm-hmm. They still to this day have the unbroken record of having more top ten hits than any other girl group. Oh, no big deal. No. I mean, and this was, was in, the small be- in the 60s. Right. And it still hasn't been broken. That's crazy to me. Right. They sold more records. They toured the world. Oh, my God. They also were, like, embedded in scandal. Ooh. A scandalo. A scandalo. Because, of course... Um, they were part of Motown, which was Barry Gordy Jr. Mm-hmm. Uh, started this record company. And he and Smokey Robinson were kind of ran it. They wrote the music with another little group of folks. And um, the Supremes, originally, Diana Ross was not the lead singer. Florence Ballard was the lead singer. Isn't this the story of Dream Girls? <laughs> Ish, yes. Because okay. the big girl was the lead singer. And the big girl had the voice. And Diana Ross... Had the kind of thin, mm, white girl reedy, voice. kind of more white girl voice, yeah. right? Yeah. And Barry Gordy's like, this is how we're going to get on white mm-hmm. music stations. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Hand her to white We're going to have the girl that everybody's going to just go, oh, must be a white girl. Mm-hmm. And have her do all the leads. And so they took the leads away from Florence Ballard, gave it to Diana Ross, who, by the way, was also sleeping with Barry Gordy. That just doesn't hurt your career, I don't no. imagine. We're... Unless you're bad at it, and then girl. But listen, <laughs> here's the other thing about that. So she had a child by Barry Gordy, yeah. who didn't know Barry Gordy was her dad until she was a grown up. That's horrible. What? what? What's well, she... funny though? She looks just freaking like Barry Gordy. But she like, herself. what would like, be the point? How do you not know that's your dad? What was the point of like not telling her? I don't you know. You know what I mean? I don't know because Miss Ross doesn't call. She doesn't write, so no. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Less. But at the same time, kind of as well, actually a little bit later, probably than the Supremes, there was other things like. The uh, Ronnie Spector and the, you know, the Marvelettes and the different, but um, Spector Records, Phil Spector, hmm. you, probably, you probably know Phil Spector <laughs> from being a crazy, yeah, with the, uh, who murdered some lady mm-hmm. and that went to hair. prison and that Girl, hair. That hair. It, and that I didn't know though that that hair wasn't his hair. It was a wig. Well, he did that on purpose. He put, that was his going to court hair. I'm dying. <laughs> I didn't realize that. Yeah, if then. y'all... Look it up. Uh huh. Phil Spector. Phil Spector, when he went to court, when he mm-hmm. went to trial for murder. Look up Phil Spector electrocuted and you'll find yeah. it. Well, Girl, you'll what's find in, that. so they made a, a movie of this whole thing and it was genius and you should watch it if you find it. Anyhow, but Spector Records did this whole recreation of music and they did this thing called The Wall of Sound where it was huge instrumentals and wonderful. Anyway, I was totally taken by that. <clears throat> and the very first time I heard uh, their version of Santa Claus is Coming to Town, I was like, well, what is this garbage? I've been singing my whole mm-hmm. life with this Santa Claus. Is, and we're here, Santa Claus is coming to town. I was like, what? Uh-huh. Girl, I'm never going to sing it that other way again. With, I, with the Puritans, girl. I don't I think know. so. Uh-uh. And the Spectre Records Christmas, my favorite Christmas album. Go buy it. Buy it. Do people but people don't buy them? What do you do? You did just you buy say stuff. record also? I did say record. Shut up. But no one's vinyl. Pay for all you cool cats. No, and vinyl's kittens. coming back. It's vinyl. Yeah, it's not vinyl's... records. <laughs> oh right, you're right. Oh, the hipsters duh. don't say records. Mm-hmm. They say vinyl. vinyl. Oh my god, I'm gonna go vinyl. I'm buying oh, I bought yeah. the new Adele on vinyl. Like shut up. Is that a boot? <laughs> you bought vinyl, but I don't mm. but... I know, girl, I don't get it. But at that time, music for me was so just transformative and uh, Aretha Franklin mm-hmm. and The Fifth Dimension mm-hmm. and groups like that who were just all over the charts. I mean, not in comparison to the white artists, sure, but sure. they were really starting to have much more presence on the charts. And it's interesting because I was looking at the music charts and like the top 100 or the top 50 or top whatever. And... In the 50s, the black arts were just starting to be kind of have a presence. But what was weird to me about that, I mean, probably not for the time, most black artists did not have their picture on their record. Hmm. 
because they wanted the white children to buy their records. Sure. See. And so, oh, sorry. I, <laughs> they were I apparently thought I was so impressive with what I was oh, saying that I needed white a plus children. I don't black know. music. But they, to, in order to get white children to buy the music of black artists, they wouldn't put their picture on the on the album because right. they're like, oh, look, mom and dad, it's it's a white person probably. I don't yeah, know. I can't don't know. tell. <laughs> but. In the 60s, you saw more presence, but in the 70s, you really started to see a presence with with black artists, which I love. Because before that, it was more, you know, the soul chart mm. was where you would see. Because, mm-hmm. you know, if, even, to, even now, you have the dance chart and the soul chart and the pop chart and the rock chart. Mm-hmm. And it's like, good Lord. But there's always been the one, like, the top hundred songs which just were the best selling songs of that year yeah so certain people just really dominated the charts and the supremes did that and then in the 70s the late 70s once with the influx of disco Mm -hmm. it was mostly black artists and so we're gonna also talk a little bit about disco and its influence and its untimely death and all of that. It was nonsense. more like an untimely transformation. <laughs> it kind of was. I mean, but it was the way that it happened. It was seriously the work of, you know, racism, mm-hmm. sexism, yeah. you know, all of the isms. The isms, girl. It was. But before we dive into all of that, we should probably just take a real quick break. Mm-hmm. And we Hi. are back. We were gone so, so long, long, I forgot we were talking about. Mm-hmm. Oh. And we too. Not really. So the death of disco. So disco music was kind of the first time in history that you had tons of, of black artists. But you also had a lot of Latinx mm-hmm. artists mm-hmm. and queer artists who were all just, you know, kind of having a go at mm-hmm. this and succeeding and being celebrated and uh one of the quotes that i I love this i read this uh, in an article from rolling stone magazine i said disco culture was a sweet spot in the american history where black brown and queer people were not forced to live in the shadow of mainstream rock and roll Mm -hmm. which so true right but that was also what caused the big brouhaha the disco sucks and the death of disco kind of thing but that, down to its core, was started by uh, a DJ in Chicago. And yes, I am going to call him out by name because he was an asshole. Steve Dahl was this 24-year-old white boy. Ew. I know, right? Who had his own radio show. and That, that can't be problematic. A 24-year-old no, white boy with his no, own radio show. I can't see any problem with that. Oh, yummy. No. And so he, he hated disco. And so on his show, where they were trying to change the format from rock and roll over to disco, mm-hmm. he didn't want to. And so he would play, he would put on a disco song. Now this is back when they had records, and DJs actually put a record on a turntable, and he would scratch the needle uh. across the record and then make the, you know, the sound effect of an explosion. Exactly like, like that. that. Just like that, except probably higher quality. And then break the record and throw it away. Oh, and, no. of course, he did this enough that his bosses were like, dude, no, we're trying to go to disco. Yeah. And so they fired him. Good. And he uh, started this whole movement, this disco sucks. And his followers, who were a bunch of angry young white boys. Oh, God. I know the worst. So a bunch of proud boys. <laughs> Basically, <laughs> love it. But he made such a splash and made so much noise that they started putting him on different TV shows and interviewing him because, well, he was a draw now. Great, right? And so, in 1979, July 1979, he they thought it, the Chicago White Sox <laughs> thought it would be fun to have a night, a disco socks night, where if you came and brought a disco album that they were going to blow up. Because mm-hmm. that was his thing, blowing up the albums. Then you could get in for 98 cents. 
I don't know why 98, but it's, yeah. I'm sure there's some significance.